I'm joined now by the writer of what I think is one of the best Doctor Whos. I'd like to introduce Matthew Jacobs. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. And uh, you keeping yourself busy during all this? Yes. Yes, actually, surprisingly so. Um, and I'm up early here um, to talk to you. And uh, I'm excited that people are going to be watching the show. After all these years, 24 years, gosh. Yes, it probably, you know, amongst everything you've done is a fair while ago now, but is it something that continues to come back to you? Yes, very much so. Um, uh, I mean, for a while I was sort of very separate from the whole Doctor Who community. And then when the um, uh, 50th happened and they brought um, the 8th Doctor back briefly for the um, Night of the Doctor, I think it was, um, then um, suddenly everybody got interested again in the 8th Doctor. And I started going to conventions, and so I've been involved in that. And in fact, we've been making a little documentary called Doctor Who Am I, um, which is a fun piece, which there'll be a link for, I think, on, on the page for this. Um, it's got a good Facebook page, and we're just finishing it off now. And it's, a, um, and it's an exploration of the American fandom, because the TV movie was very much, you know, the idea was to create it as an American show, but it's still being a British show. Mm, so it was a very difficult sort of line to tread. Um, and uh, um, so it really made sense to make a documentary about, because there are millions of, of American Doctor Who fans and they, they don't really get covered that much except that everybody thinks they're very weird. Um, and they're not. You know, there's this fantastic community there. It was a community I was a bit afraid of, to be honest. And then, and then I got drawn into it. And so it, it's, it's turned into a lovely little film, really, about, about um, the sense of community that there is in Doctor Who fandom around the world. Um, and it's quite unique. I mean, people forget that Doctor Who is, in fact, according to the Guinness Book of Records, the most successful um, science fiction show ever. So we forget that. But how different is fandom where, you know, over in the US as opposed to the UK? Because you just say it's initially a British show, but loved around the world. Yes. I think, this is just my opinion, I think it's not so much about the show. I think it's about the fact that, the, that people from all walks of life and all ages come together around this show. And they, cre they do create a community. And certainly in America, it's more of a, it's a community. I don't really, I'm not really able to compare it to British fandom because I don't really know that much about British fandom. Um, but certainly in the, in the American community, um, it's a, it really is about a sense of family and a sense of acceptance, um, which reflects the values of the doctor. Um, and certainly in the TV movie, um, the thing that I was going for was the, you know, the Doctor as a as a as a lover of humans. I mean, he he really he really admires the way humans can see patterns in everything, even when there's nothing there. Um, so and, and and so he's a, and of course you know he's half human in in. A, in the TV movie, which created a furora. I mean, the, the kissing, the romance, all of that ended up being absorbed by the show when it came back in 2005. Um, and uh, he became, he stopped being your crazy uncle or grandfather, and he became much more um, of a partner of somebody who you went on an adventure with. And that really did start, um, you know, it had started a little bit, I think, with Davidson, and and but but I think it really started with um, with with Paul's Doctor, um, and then that was very much there when it came back. But the half human thing, it was very much a plot thing, um, and it was also what I felt very strongly, which was that was the 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 Doctor must have a lot of human in him. He's a lot of humanity in him because he's most of his adventures are based around Earth. So when you started working on the film, how aware were you of the legacy of the show and the fandom? You know, was it 
just an, the next job or were you aware that there's a lot of baggage with this project? I was obviously aware of a lot of baggage because I came from, um, oh, well, obviously I'm British, and, but also my dad had been in it when I was a little boy. Um, and so I, it had been very much part of my childhood. So the opportunity to, to write for a character that I'd always loved just seemed fantastic. And it was at a time in my life um, when I'd been doing a lot of that, I'd been doing Young Indiana Jones, I'd been, been doing a big Disney thing that eventually became The Emperor's New Groove, I'd been doing stuff for Jim Henson. I'd been very much involved in sort of big franchise kind of characters. So to, it seemed natural that when Doctor Who came along and I knew the major players on it, that when I went in for that, and I went in with the pitch of basically Doctor Who Am I, um, and uh, that was really what, that's really what the main body of the story is, him re, in order to be the Doctor, in order to save the world, he has to realize who he is. Um, and in the bargain, um, so the American public, which is what it was initially aimed for, um, would get a chance to learn who this iconic science fiction character in fact is. So I came to the project very aware of the size of the sort of fandom and indeed the executive producer, Philip Siegel, who was obsessed by it and he'd been trying to get this thing made for years when, and there were other writers before me, you know, who tried and failed and tried and failed. Nobody could agree. And when I managed to get everybody in the room to agree on, on what this was going to be, he then had a separate meeting with me where he boldly gave me, he said, here you are. And he gave me the key to the TARDIS. And I thought, okay, these guys are nuts. <laughs> I'd better be careful here. <laughs> they believe. <laughs> and so, there was, so already with the big gap that had gone on and the fact that it had become this iconic thing, already there, were, there was a law. There was L-O-R-E. Um, there, was a, there was a whole bunch of rules connected with the Doctor already by then, um, I think. And that was so... But I, try, I had to try and put all of that aside. And I think every writer who deals with it... Um, I mean, I don't know so much about more recent writers, but, but certainly I think every writer has to put a little bit aside um, and just focus on what it is about the Doctor that they really love and can identify with um, and uh, so, that, so that there's some passion behind it so that it's not too calculated. Um, and Because I think when it feels calculated, audiences know that people respond well when they feel like there's a passionate story there. And that's why, you know, the, the, all these shows like Star Wars, and they've all become better because the passion of of the fandom has taken over the show really and shows are being made by the fans really now so so it's a it's a two-way street and i suppose the the only sort of real aspects you pulled on from the history of the show was of course sylvester's doctor and the master was there ever a conversation not to include sylvester in it um well when I picked up the project, Sylvester was the the previous Doctor wasn't in it. Uh, but so um, I was I was told not to read any of the previous attempts, and I didn't. Um, so it was a natural thing for me to say, well, of course, if we're going to have a new Doctor, that we have to see the last Doctor die. Now there was a debate because obviously Universal didn't care. If you're just starting a new show, let's just start it with the Doctor, which is kind of what they did in 2005 when they brought Eccleston in. Let's just, let's just you know, reboot. Um, and uh, so there was that discussion. Um, but I think, um, you know, I felt, and so did Philip Siegel, and so did Trevor Walter, and, and so did the main players involved in producing the film at the BBC. They, the BBC actually were, you know, on... Uh, you know, didn't really care that much, but they and they weren't sure whether or not Sylvester should be there at the time, as far as I remember. But they were convinced, basically, that everybody said, "Nah, listen, you've got to do it. You've got to 
kill one doctor and bring and, and, and have him rise again. You know, it's got to, you've got to do that. So we did it. And of course it created a few problems down the line um, because people were saying, why are you doing that? And then at one point you have Universal saying, uh, saying, we don't really understand what's going on in this movie. You need a voiceover at the beginning. This was in post-production. So I ended up feeling like, feeling like the newscaster in, in a um, network, you know, being hauled into a room with the head of Universal sitting in the dark saying, you need a voiceover to say what's going on at the beginning. And we ended up having to write that voiceover, which I've always, it always pisses me. I almost block my ears when I list it because it's giving away too much and it's confusing things at the beginning. It would have been better just to, as the original script, just go into it. But that's all Monday morning quarterbacking, as they say here. It's, it's not really, it, it is what it is. I don't mind it now. You know what I mean? It, you, you, you go along with it. It's, but it is very much, um, you know, a question. Do you have, do you bring the old doctor into play when you revive a show? Um, do you bring it, do you bring it back? And then of course, big finish after we done the movie and big finish picked up the show and they really carried on with, um, with Paul's doctor. They did a wonderful job. I mean, and, and Paul's doctor stayed alive all the way through and still alive really on big finish. And so it's almost like another dimension where you can follow other doctors and other masters. And we definitely brought wanted the master because really dialects are, were very hard to do. If you were going to, in that era, you couldn't really do a clunky dialect, dialect running around. It just didn't work. Um, so it was better to have the master. And it also gave an opportunity for us to, just in simple production terms, do some um, good American casting so that there would be an American name there. Um, because ultimately, you know, out of the five, six million that they were spending of it, only one million of that money was coming from the BBC. The rest of the money was coming from Fox and Universal. Because again, in terms of Big Finish, it's worth mentioning that this week, Eric Roberts has been announced as having his own Big Finish series. So it's a, another yeah. character which has continued beyond the film. Call me master. When I first heard about it, I went, how are they, how are they going to do that? Because he comes to life as an you know, ambulance um, man, um, and then he's sucked into a vortex. So I thought to myself, well, could there be some adventure that happens between him and E.G. You know, while they're waiting for the doctor to come to the TARDIS? Um, could they go off somewhere else and come back? Um, and then I and then I think I've read that basically he gets rescued from his his um, you know demise where he gets sucked into the vortex rather like the Wicked Witch of the West. Um, and and they, he's they, yeah they rescue him and he goes off on a parallel adventure. Um, I think it's great because Eric's fantastic, um, and I think people have been unfair about that master to be honest I, that master was up uh, the master we were going for was really fun do you know what i mean he was he was it was slightly it was slightly more pantomime um and and let's face it at the end of the day he's a piece of goo um that's <laughs> that comes out so yes there's a i wonder what they're going to do with him i think they'll 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 um i think they'll probably do a great job Eric Roberts was key in getting an American name in the sort of forefront of it. When taking a show that is very British, you know, London buses are in it, you know, England is part of the very nature of the show. How do you retain that, but also make it appeal to an American audience? Well, none of it, it was, you know, the show was very much set in San Francisco, even though we shot it in Vancouver. Um, it was, um, um, so, the only thing that was really British about it, you know, was the fact that um, it was being directed and written by, by Brits and, and, uh, um, and it was also came from a British show, but it really, the idea and, and that Paul was British. He, everybody else was American. Um, and yes, it obeyed the sort of structure of an American TV movie, um, which is very much acts with cliffhangers. Do you know what I'm saying? So, 
So you, because you have to have the cliffhangers so that people can sell you stuff, which is really what American TV is about, um, or American network TV, especially in the 90s. Um, so, yes, um, but apart from that, I didn't worry too much about whether or not it was American. I just wrote what I liked. 